So let's say you have a risk-free rate. You've estimated an equity risk premium. You now have the ingredients for estimating the expected return for an average risk investment. But what if your investment is not average risk? You need a measure of relative risk, right? You need to tell me whether a stock is twice as risky or, or is half as risky as an average risk stock. That's basically what a beta tries to do. Now, beta comes with a lot of baggage, a lot of theory baggage, because it's derived from risk and return models that are fundamental to finance that not everybody agrees with. Here's the basic message I'd like to deliver in this session. I will go through the process of how conventional betas work and how you might be able to estimate them better. But I'll also offer you choices, alternatives to conventional betas, which try to measure the relative risk of an investment. I hope at the end of the session, you will be able to answer that question. So in the last two sessions, we've covered the first two ingredients of a discount rate model or a cost of equity model. One is the risk-free rate, which can be a little bit of work, and an equity risk premium, which requires a little bit of thought. This session, I want to focus on the third input into this process. And let's put the, the basics here. If you have a risk-free rate and an equity risk premium, you have the ingredients for estimating the cost of equity for an average risk company. But what if your company is not average risk? So the core of what we're going to try to do in this session is talk about how to measure that relative risk. How do we say whether a company is one and a half times more risky than the average company or half as risky as the average company? Now, I'm going to use beta as my way of talking through this process, but I want to set the table on all of the different ways you can think about relative risk. There are these approaches that have come out of modern portfolio theory, and we've got to be grateful for those because they've put some rigor into the process, whether it's beta, or betas, or multiple betas. They're all approaches that build off traditional portfolio theory. You can just look at stock price-based approaches where you can look at the standard deviation of a stock relative to the average, but you're still trusting market prices. You can use accounting measures, accounting ratios, earnings variability. But ultimately, what I want out of this process is a measure of relative risk. What I'm trying to say here, though, is if you don't like betas, don't give up on relative risk. Think of a different way of measuring relative risk, and we're on the same page. So I'm going to start off with the CAPM beta, because much of what we know about valuation is still built around the CAPM beta. If you go back and review the CAPM, the CAPM, all of the, the exposure to ma market risk or macroeconomic risk is captured in one number, the beta. And if you've taken a finance class, or even if you've just browsed through a finance class, we've all been taught how to estimate beta in exactly the same way. We've all been told, run a regression a regression of returns on the stock against returns on a market index. The slope of the line is the beta. That should be pretty simple to do, right? So let's try this out. I took Embraer and I ran a regression. I came up with a beta. That should be my answer, right? That's the beta I used in my valuation. But then I took Embraer again and I ran another regression and I got a very different beta. The first message I want to deliver is when you talk about a regression beta, the answer you get can depend upon how you set up the regression. How you set up the regression in the following terms. First is what period did you run the regression over? What index did you use? Did you use daily returns or weekly returns or monthly returns or annual returns? A regression beta is just a way of thinking about beta and it's not a very good way of thinking about beta. It gives you a statistical answer to what is the beta for the company. And many of these regressions, one thing to remember is when you get a coefficient, which is what the beta is, that coefficient comes with a standard error. In other words, it could be wrong. And if you look at the regression output, it actually tells you how wrong you could be. The number that captures that is the standard error of the beta. Let me give you a statistic. The median standard error, the typical standard error, for a beta estimate for a U.S. company is about 0.20. You say, what are you talking about? If I told you the beta for Coca-Cola from a regression is 1.10, and I told you the standard error is 0.20. Here's what I'm telling you. The true beta for Coca-Cola could be as low as 0.7, that's 2 times 0.2, below 1.1, or 1.5, that's 2, point, 2 times 0.2, above 1.1. A beta estimate is a noisy estimate, and especially if you're using one regression, one slice of data, that noise can overwhelm your estimate. You say, what if my regression looks really good? Be very careful. The worst beta estimates often come from the best-looking regressions. Here's my favorite example for this. This is a beta page I printed off for Nokia a long time ago. Now, Nokia is a Finnish company, and when I asked for a beta from the, from the service I use, which is Bloomberg, this is the page that showed up. 
It's a great looking regression, right? If you define great looking as high R squared, low standard error, but it's deceptive. It's deceptive for the following reason. This is a regression of Nokia against a Helsinki stock exchange. And you know what percentage of that exchange Nokia was at the time of this regression? It was about 80%. So what you have is a regression of Nokia against Nokia. It tells you absolutely nothing about how much risk Nokia will add to your portfolio if you're an investor. So here's what I'd like you to do. When you think about betas, stop thinking about a single regression delivering the number that you're going to use as your beta. Instead, start thinking in macro terms. The beta for a company does not come from a regression. It comes from three choices that that company makes. First, what kind of business is it in? Here's the general rule. The more discretionary your product or service is as a company, the higher your beta will be as a company. You say, what do you mean more discretionary? If your customers can live without your product, they can delay buying it, they can defer buying it, you should have a higher beta than if you produce a good or service that's an absolute necessity. A grocery store should have a lower beta than Tiffany's. So that's the first building block for beta. Think about what your company does. Second, tell me something about your cost structure. The greater the proportion of your costs that are fixed costs, the higher your beta will be as a company. Why? Because if you have a lot of fixed costs, good times become great, bad times become terrible. Everything gets magnified. So if you're in a business with a lot of fixed costs, I would expect you to have a higher beta than if you're in a business with low fixed costs. And here's the third and final ingredient. When you borrow money, you create a fixed cost you do not have until you borrow that money, right? It's interest expenses. Interest expenses make your good times even better for equity investors. They make your bad times even worse. They magnify risk again. So the more you borrow, the higher your beta will be as a company. So when I sit down to value a company, rather than looking at a regression page, I start with the fundamentals. What does this company do? What kind of beta would I expect, given what it does? What does its cost structure look like, given, given the business it's in, and how much has it borrowed? Answering those questions is going to give me a much better insight into what the beta for that company should be than looking at a regression and taking the slope of the line as my beta. Now, I'm actually going to use this page as my building block for an alternative to regression betas. I call these bottom-up betas, but don't get thrown off by the terminology. Here's what I'm going to do. Let's say you're a company and you want me to estimate your beta. I'm going to start off by asking you a question. Tell me what business or businesses you're in. So let's play along. Let's assume you tell me you're in the steel and the chemical business. I'll say I'll be back tomorrow. I'm going to go back and find as many publicly traded steel companies and as many publicly traded chemical companies as I can. Because they're publicly traded, I can look up their regression betas. I'm going to average the betas out. I'm going to come up with an average beta across steel companies, an average beta across chemical companies. Now, I know that beta can be affected by how much debt these companies have, so I'm going to clean up for that. That's called unlevering the beta. It sounds fancy, but I'm taking out the effect of debt. And what I'll end up with is a pure beta, or a business beta for being in the steel and the chemical businesses. And I come back to you and say, tell me what, how much of your value you get from each of these businesses. Now, you might not be able to give me how much value you get, but you can, might be able to give me the revenues you get from each business. I'll take a weighted average. That's going to give me a beta for the businesses you're in as a company. Final question I'm going to ask you is, tell me how much debt and equity you have as a company. You could give me your actual debt to equity ratio. You could give me a target. And I'm going to come up with a beta for your equity based on the businesses you're in and the leverage you've chosen. That's called a bottom-up beta. Now, why am I doing this? Because I don't like regression betas, right? But think about it. Where did I get the betas for all those steel companies and chemical companies? They were regression betas. All I've done is replaced a single regression beta with an average of 100 or 500. So where's the savings? Remember the law of large numbers from statistics? Put crudely, here's what it says. You can take 100 rotten betas, you can average them out, and the average is going to be magically precise. I've always wondered how that happened. But the answer is actually pretty intuitive. When I say the standard error of a beta is high, here's what I'm saying. Some of these betas are overestimated, some are underestimated, right? When I average them out, I average, them, average out my mistakes. That is the biggest selling point for bottom-up betas. A bottom-up beta, because it's an average across many betas, is going to be far more precise than any individual regression beta. Here's the second advantage. If you entered the chemical business yesterday, there is zero chance a regression beta could capture that risk. But if I do a bottom-up beta, I get to set the weights. I can even be proactive. I can bring in businesses 
you plan to be in, even though you're not in them today. And finally, a bottom-up beta, I can estimate for a private business. I could never do a regression beta for a private business. So I'm actually wedded to bottom-up betas. It's been almost 15 years since I've done a valuation using a regression beta, and that should tell you how strongly I feel about using sector average or bottom-up betas in my valuation. So we've got a beta for a single business company in Briar. Let's, let's up the ante. Let's try a more difficult case. Let's assume you have a company in two businesses. In this case, SAP, which is a German software company. SAP actually classifies itself as being in three businesses. I've kind of condensed them into two. And these are the two businesses I see them in, software and consulting. I went and found publicly traded software companies and consulting firms, and I came up with unlevered betas for each of those businesses. There's only one more step left, right? I've got to estimate how much value SAP gets from each of these businesses. Now, looking at SAP's financial statements, I was able to get revenues for each of these businesses. And if I were short of time, I could have used those revenue weights. But when you do that, you're implicitly assuming that a dollar in revenue in one business is worth about the same as a dollar in revenue in the other business. And that might or might not be true, especially if you have different margins. So I added one more layer of estimation detail. Remember those comparable companies from which I got those betas? I also looked up an additional number. I looked to see what multiple of revenues companies in each of these businesses were trading at. So basically, I'm looking to see whether the market is valuing these companies at two times revenues, three times revenues, five times revenues. I applied that multiple of revenues for software companies to the revenues that SAP gets from its software business to get an estimated value for SAP software business. I did the same thing for the consulting business. When I was done, Based on my estimates, it looks like SAP is about 80% software, 20% consulting. I use those to come up with a weighted average. That gives me the unlevered beta, the beta for the businesses that SAP is in. So when we talk about unlevered betas, that's what we're talking about, the betas for the businesses you're in. One final step, so I looked up the debt to equity ra ratio for SAP, and SAP is not a company that uses a lot of debt. Its debt to equity ratio is only 1.4%. Using that debt-to-equity ratio and the German corporate tax rate, I came up with a beta for SAP as a company. That's my estimate for beta. That's what I would use if I were valuing SAP. I would not be using the regression beta. So let me sum up. You want a measure of relative risk. You might not like betas. That's fine. Don't use betas. Give me your alternate. It could be based on accounting measures. It could be based on qualitative measures. All I need is a measure of relative risk. And why do I need that? Without a measure of relative risk, I'm attaching the same discount rate to companies with very different risk profiles. So don't let your disdain for betas lead you down that path. Come up with a measure of relative risk, and everything we've talked about today will still follow through.